Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Hello everybody, this is Margareta Harris in WHO Headquarters Geneva, welcoming you today, November 29, 2023, to our press briefing on current global health issues. As usual, we will start with opening remarks from our Director General, Dr. Tedros Adnom Ghebreyesus, and I will then open the floor to questions. And our panel of technical experts, both here in the room and online, will be available to answer your questions. In the room, we have a large panel. On Dr. Tedros' right, we have Dr. Mike Ryan, our Executive Director for our Emergencies Program. Next to Dr. Ryan, we have Dr. Ilham Noor, our Acting Incident Manager for the Occupied Palestinian Territory Israel Escalation. Next to Dr. Noor is Dr. Maria Nera, our Director, director of our Department for Environment, Climate Change and Health. And next to Dr. Nera is Mr. Andy Seal, our Technical Officer for HIV, Hepatitis and Sexually Transmitted Infections. And next to Mr. Seal is Mr. Derek Walton, our Legal Counsel. And to Dr. Tedros' left, we have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, Acting Director of our Department for Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention. We also do have our usual large panel of experts online and we will call upon them whenever appropriate when you ask your questions. But now, without further ado, we'll go to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Margarita. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. WHO welcomes the extension of the humanitarian pause in the conflict in Gaza and the release of hostages and prisoners by both sides. The pause has enabled WHO to increase deliveries of medical supplies in Gaza and to transfer patients from Al-Shifa Hospital to other hospitals south of the Wadi Gaza. During the first three days of the pause, WHO received 121 pallets of supplies into our warehouse in Gaza including IV fluids, medicines, lab supplies, medical disposables, and trauma and surgical supplies. This is enough to support about 90,000 people. However, much more is needed. We continue to call for a sustained ceasefire so that aid can continue to be delivered to end further civilian suffering and we call for the remaining Israeli hostages to be released and for those who are still being held to receive the medical care they need. WHO's greatest concern remains supporting Gaza's health system and health workers to function. Only 15 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are still functioning at all, but are completely overwhelmed. For example, European Gaza Hospital is currently operating at triple its capacity. Of the 25 hospitals north of the Wadi Gaza, before the conflict began, only three are functioning at the most basic level, but they lack fuel, water, and food. The remaining health system capacity must be protected, supported, and expanded. The health needs of the population of Gaza have increased dramatically but they are now being serviced by one-third of the hospitals and primary care clinics. And with severe overcrowding, the risks are increasing for epidemics of respiratory tract infections, acute watery diarrhea, hepatitis, 
miscabies, lies, and other diseases. WHO is working to support Gaza's health system and health workers in every way we can. Together with partners, we're distributing supplies, coordinating emergency medical teams to provide extra clinical capacity for existing hospitals, and establishing standalone field hospitals in strategic locations. We thank those partners who are working with us. But we repeat that emergency medical teams and field hospitals can only complement Gaza's health system, not replace it. The priority must be to support Gaza's health workers, hospitals and clinics to do their jobs. This week, the world is converging in the United Arab Emirates for COP28, the United Nations Climate Change Conference. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, about 3.5 billion people, nearly half of humanity, live in areas highly vulnerable to the climate crisis. This year alone, catastrophic flooding in Libya and the Horn of Africa has cost lives and livelihoods, and just this week, Brazil hit record temperatures. An unhealthy planet means unhealthy people. Heat-related deaths among people aged over 65 years have climbed by 70% globally in two decades. Every year, 7 million people die from air pollution. Changing weather patterns driven by human activity and the burning of fossil fuels is contributing to record numbers of cholera outbreaks. And our warming planet is expanding the range of mosquitoes which carry dangerous pathogens like dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and yellow fever into places that have never dealt with them before. The climate crisis is a health crisis. So we're pleased that for the first time, this year's COP will include a day dedicated to health, with more than 50 health ministers attending from around the world. While at COP, I will make three specific calls. First, a climate-friendly world. WHO calls on leaders from government and industry to work together to phase out fossil fuels urgently and accelerate the transition to clean energy. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas are by far the largest contributor to global climate change, accounting for over 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. Winning the world of fossil fuels is therefore the only way for countries to meet their commitment to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is a public health imperative. Second, climate-friendly health systems. While the health sector is affected by climate change, it also contributes to it, with about 5% of global emissions. We must focus on decarbonizing health systems to reduce that. At the same time, we must build continue to strengthen health systems to be more climate resilient. That means strengthening the health workforce and the surveillance systems, building on investments that many countries made during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it means scaling up vector control and access to safe water and sanitation. Third, finance. The health sector is at the front line of the climate crisis, that it receives just half of 1% of global climate financing. The world spends trillions of dollars of public monies in fossil fuel subsidies every year. We call on governments and investors to redirect those funds to protecting and promoting the health of our planet and the health of people. And we ask also for the international community to honor the pledge of 100 billion US dollars for climate change annually. Finally, this Friday marks World AIDS Day. 
This year's theme is Let Communities Lead. It affirms the vital role that affected communities play in leading the response to HIV. Thanks to decades of activism, advocacy, and support from affected communities, millions of new infections have been averted and 30 million people are now receiving antiretroviral therapy. As prevention and treatment services for HIV are increasingly delivered in community and primary health care settings, communities and community health workers are even more critical. We must stand together to ensure communities have the funding and resources they need to stand up for human rights, to fight stigma, and to help us and AIDS for good. I thank you. And Margaret, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, we'll now open the floor to questions. As I should have mentioned, if you want to ask a question, please use the raise your hand icon if you haven't done that already. Uh, there are a lot of you online and there are a lot of you with hands raised. So please keep your questions short and clear. And if you know who it's addressed to, uh, do mention that as well and give your name and outlet. The first question goes to Helen Branswell from STAT. Helen, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, thank you very much, Margaret. I think this is probably for Maria. Um, it's a follow-up to the um, uh, situation in China. I'm wondering if WHO is hearing of other places that are seeing an increase in mycoplasma um, pneumonia in children as well as the Chinese authorities have. Thank you. So thanks, Helen, for the question. So um, yes, I mean, we are seeing uh, in general an increase in respiratory infections around the world. Um, we do tend to see increases in children because they're the school-aged children and in the Northern Hemisphere, we're entering the, it's the autumn already, and we're entering the winter months. So we are expecting to see increases in uh, acute respiratory infections. Um, mycoplasma pneumonia is not a reportable disease to WHO. So we tend to track this information through uh, reporting systems and through discussions with our member states. Um, we have seen, as we, we, you and I had discussed earlier, or last week, um, we are following up with the situation in China, and again, they have seen overall an increase in acute respiratory infections due to a number of different uh, pathogens, uh, including influenza, which is on the rise. Uh, mycoplasm pneumonia was on the rise for the last couple of months and now seems to be a little bit on the decline. We're following up through our clinical networks and working with uh, clinicians in China to better understand uh, resistance um, to antibiotics, which is a problem um, across the world, but is a particular problem in the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia region. Um, we do, one of the things we are following up on um, in terms of the acute respiratory infections is looking at burden in healthcare systems. So it's one thing to see a rise in these types of infections, particularly in school-aged children, but also to monitor the severity and looking at the healthcare capacities uh, around the world to be able to deal with these types of infections, looking at what are the treatment options that are there, and there are many antibiotics that are available for uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, I don't have the specifics on the rates around the country, around the world, um, for this particular bacteria, but we have seen outbreaks of mycoplasma pneumonia in a number of countries um, over the course of many different years. So I can follow up with you on some specifics um, on that and specifically in China and elsewhere. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question goes to Alicia Sanchez from Europa Press News Agency, uh, Spain. So Alicia, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Alicia, we're not hearing you. Are you having problems? We'll go to the next question. The next question goes to Alexandra Tin of CBS. Alexandra, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the report last week about BA286. I was wondering if you could clarify what you think the role of JN1 is in BA286's growth, and if you have any updates to share on what you've heard about its comparative severity. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's another one for Dr. Van Kerkhoff. 
Yeah, thanks very much. So we are continuing to track uh, the variants around the world. Um, and BA.2.86 was recently uh, classified as a variant of interest. It was formerly a variant under monitoring. Within BA.2.86 includes this uh, further sublineage of JN.1. Globally, we have about 10% of the sequences um, that are reported to public platforms are BA.2.86 and its sublineages. Um, in terms of our assessment, there's still very small numbers. Um, so I don't have the exact number of sequences in this, uh, in this grouping, but it's around 4,000, just over 4,000 sequences globally. Um, it has a growth advantage, um, but this is what we expect from variants that are you know, classified as variants of interest. Um, in terms of severity, we don't see a change in the disease profile of people infected with BA.2.86 and its sublineages, including JN.1. But it is one, of course, to watch. Um, when we look at severity, we are looking at any changes in hospitalizations. We are looking at any changes in disease presentation. Um, and we don't see that um, for this particular uh, variant of interest and its sublineages. So again, um, anyone who is infected with SARS-CoV-2, including BA.2.86 and its sublineages, can cause a full range of disease, everything from asymptomatic infection all the way to severe disease and death. Our um, vaccines um, are still working very well against protecting severe disease and death and remains really critical that those of you um, who are due for an updated vaccine of COVID-19 get that vaccine, um, it, whether it's based on the new um, XBB.1 monovalent vaccines or the vaccines based on the ancestral strain. So if you're an at-risk group, if you're of older age, if you have underlying conditions, please make sure that you're up to date on your vaccines. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question goes to Christophe Vogt from uh, Agence France Presse. Christophe, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, thank you for taking my question. It's about uh, Gaza. I was just wondering if you had uh, teams on the ground doing the assessment of what is going to be needed to bring the health system back up to pre-war uh, quality, so to say, so to speak, and uh, if you have any idea of uh, how much money that would cost. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have Dr. Rick Pepercorn online who can answer that question, and we may have supplemented answers in the in the room. Dr. Pepercorn, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, maybe let me start with with Gaza. Um, had thirty six hospitals uh, before this war, and and three thousand five hundred hospital beds. Uh, currently, we talk about fifteen hospitals which are functional and and or we call partially or barely functional. And it's important to be specific. I think the DG referred already a bit to this. So there's 12 in the South, which are currently all overwhelmed and and, uh, and partially to fully functional. There's three in the North, uh, Al-Adwa, Al-Ahli and Al-Sahaba, which are working more on minimum levels, more like almost first aid centers. And three other ones, uh, the well-known Shifa Indonesian and Kamal Adwan, they have some patients left, but they don't accept any patients uh, yet uh, anymore. Shifa is again having uh, some dialysis patients, but it is really mi minimal. So we have 3,500 deaths, currently 1,500 deaths. And, and, and this may be the first thing uh, what we, we are focusing on. You ask what is needed. So first of all, the bed capacity needs to be expanded as quickly as possible with the functional hospitals. And, and that's part of the WHO operational plan. So first, how do we restore the health sector and the, the referral pathway, primary care, secondary care, and, and, and third referral care? And linked to these hospitals, we need to strategically position emergency medical teams, which is currently ongoing in, in, in very few uh, places to help expand the needed bed capacity. So how do we bring the bed capacity from 1,500 to 2,000 to 2,500? We estimate there's a need of 5,000 beds. So we have a really a long way to go. And as Dr. Tedros says, complementary to that, there is a need for a few strategic located field hospitals. But again, we all have to focus on, on making sure that the, the cripples the crippled and, and very much, um, uh, yeah, the vulnerable health system, which we have now, is 
becoming fully functional. There are Gaza health workers. We have more than 20,000 Gaza health workers, very good health workers. We need to make sure that they get the right supplies and medical equipment. That uh, we have some of these emergency medical teams linked to that, and we get these hospitals ticking again. And secondly, that we get the primary healthcare systems uh, working again, a referral. We talk always about trauma. We have to focus as well on maternal and child health. Uh, think about reproductive health, emergency obstetric cares, mental health, psychosocial support, non communicable diseases, and, and the whole referral system uh, linked to that. Last point I want to make is we are very concerned. The health system at the moment is extremely vulnerable. And, and when we talk about 12 hospitals in the south, they are currently the backbone the backbone of the of the health infrastructure and 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 i would like to say i'm on my way at the moment to gaza i'm in, in ismailia and i will probably hopefully tomorrow enter gaza and and discuss we have a team there a very strong team which are doing all the things i just mentioned but any resumption of violence could damage the health facilities and make m more health facilities dysfunctional I want to stress the point, Gaza can absolutely not afford to lose more hospital beds. We need to expand the number of hospital beds. We need, we need to make the vulnerable system work again. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pivako. And I'm just looking in the room. Any supplements? Yes, Dr. Ryan. Um, um, Yes, just to add to, uh, to what Rick is saying, Dr. Tedros expressed our gratitude to those um, other agencies who are providing uh, emergency medical team support and extra bed capacity, uh, particularly to those structures uh, south of the Wadi Gaza. Um, that requires the deployment of up to 750 beds that have been requested or more. Um, it is a huge ask to, to get to that level. Um, we do thank our colleagues working in the ICRC and MSF, the UAE government, the Jordanian government, the Turkish government, uh, and, and, uh, and other colleagues, IMC, and others who are working with us to try and coordinate the process of deployment. I think you'll understand that deploying international teams into a setting as complex of this is both a big logistic operation, given the restrictions on the siege and the difficulties in getting material and equipment supplied, transported and located in, um, in, in Gaza. Uh, there is also the added uh, challenge of maintaining security for these individuals when they do go to Gaza. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Many of these hospitals that we're supporting are potentially in harm's way again within the next 24 hours and we need to recognize that we're not dealing right now as far as we can see it as much as we would like this we're not dealing with a permanent pause or a, a long-scale ceasefire many of these facilities lie in very strategic locations along highways and and, and 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 as would be in any major urban conurbation you put your hospitals in strategic locations that are accessible to people but because of that uh, we really do need to get um, reliable deconfliction of these facilities so that we can continue to support them and that we won't end up in the same situation again in two or three weeks time where what we've seen in the north the collapse of health system from 25 hospitals down to three barely functioning that we don't repeat that again south of the wadi gaza there are now almost two million people internally displaced so many people living within shelters living within um, family homes, three, four, five families now per apartment, living in, in, in other types of shelter, mosques and schools, uh, community halls, everywhere is packed. The weather has deteriorated, the rain is falling, children are getting colder, nutritional status is dropping rapidly, uh, maybe a calorific count is being supported, but when we talk about a nutritious diet for children, I don't think anyone can claim that we're at the children of Gaza are receiving a nutritious diet. Uh, the, at most, they're getting barely enough calories to, 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 to survive. <clears throat> so all of the conditions are there for uh, a deterioration in the situation as Tedros has laid out. So as our colleague has asked, uh, well, quite rightly, what are the longer term plans for reconstruction in Gaza? I think it's very hard for people there right now to think about reconstruction, to think about where we go next, because we don't even know where we're going to be in 24 hours time 
We don't know where the situation is going to be in 72 hours' time. It is important to think about how this can be rebuilt, but as Rick has said, our primary focus is to support the system that still remains, to support the doctors and nurses and health professionals that are still on the ground in the best way we can so they can support their own citizens and their own people, uh, and that is the primary strategy that WHO has. As I said, we are being assisted in that hugely by the, the emergency medical teams who are deploying. Some are deploying directly into facilities to provide extra hands, extra clinical, uh, extra clinical capability, as Dr. Tedros has said. Some of them are deploying with extra bed capacity that they can add, and those beds are being added to the hospital. And some are able to come in and bring in standalone facilities, which are then being put in strategic locations. When we combine all that together, uh, as Rick has said, we've lost from 3,500, I think, beds down to less than 1,500 beds. We've lost so much capacity. Even with that wonderful effort by many, many countries and many organizations, there is no way that EMT capacity can replace the existing capacity. So therefore, the single most precious thing right now is to preserve the existing capacity in the health system in Gaza, and particularly for the for the two million displaced people who are mainly displaced to the south. Um, we then need to build from there. The costs of reconstruction, given the destruction, are massive. Reconstructing the health system, rebuilding the health workforce, rebuilding the surveillance systems, uh, rebuilding everything um, is, is going to be very hard. The one thing I will say is that if we use as a marker, and this is often used as a marker of the effectiveness of health systems, um, the immunization rates in Gaza prior to the conflict were some of the highest in the world, which means uh, regardless of, of, of the government situation, the reality is that primary prevention and basic care to individuals was being carried out beforehand. And in fact, we're, we're in many ways relying on that residual protection that exists for that population. So I do think that uh, Gaza has the health workers. It has the previous experience to deliver health and plan health and deliver health. The question is going to be, when you see the scale of the destruction of the system, how long it's going to take to rebuild and not only the shattered infrastructure, but to rebuild the shattered confidence and the shattered psychology of uh, a brave, very brave uh, and very effective uh, health workforce. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Ryan, um, Dr. Peter gorn has got a couple of things he also wants to add. I understand. Um, yes, thank you very much. I just want to add because the the, the uh, we were also questions about our plans, and I just want to say first of all, there's an overall flash appeal for this 90 days, a 90 days flash appeal for 1.2 billion covering all the areas and all the sectors. And I want to make also a plea. I want to make a plea for UNRWA for the fantastic work they're doing in in all these shelters and the absolutely needed work they're doing. But of course, we talk about food security, we talk about wash, we talk about shelter, uh, etc. On health, WHO leads and coordinates and, and with partners, uh, the 90 day appeal was 220 uh, million. Based on that WHO and on the request from our partners and donors, focused on what can WHO then do specifically besides coordinating and leading the parties. So we came with uh, the 90 days plan for 108 million and that is actually outlined very well by the DG and Mike focus on the existing system, the cripple system, but still the resilient system to expand and, and, and to make it work again, make sure that we, we link this EMTs to it and a few field hospitals, but also very much restore the, the public health intelligence and the early warning, disease prevention and control. Ensure, as a third pillar, ensure that we have a sustained supply of health and logistics and that we focus on the emergency coordination. And for that, of course, there's a need for flexible funding. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Cohen. Uh, the next question will go to Ari Daniel from NPR uh, USA. Uh, Ari, please unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Yes, hi there, everyone. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, for the last, uh, um, you know, several weeks, we've, um, you know, we've known that there's been concern around the possible spread of infectious disease, diarrheal diseases, um, uh, other, other, other types of disease within Gaza. And I'm just wondering if there's been any, like, if you've actually seen that starting to materialize, or if it's just that the threat remains ever present and, um, and more concerning than ever. Uh, Dr. Ryan, did you want to start? And then we could go to Dr. Peepercorn. I, I think we could start with Rick. I mean, all, all I, can, I can say is that, uh, as you said, uh, Ari, uh, the, the risks are, are clear. Uh, uh, we've been tracking the various uh, diseases over a number of weeks now, both uh, through the, the medical system, but also within the UNRWA displacement camps, and, and Rick can give a sense of, of that. I do know that we've picked up some very serious signals around acute jaundice syndrome, in particular part uh, of the south of the Wadi Gaza. Uh, acute jaundice syndrome is a very, very serious disease, particularly in the context of uh, if, if someone is pregnant, um, and it can spread extremely rapidly once, it's, once you've, uh, you've seen those first cases. There are many, many more. So there, there have been a, a number of signals around acute jaundice syndrome, uh, and that would be a harbinger for other uh, epidemic diarrheal disease. The main cause of acute jaundice in this context is hepatitis E, uh, and we've seen large-scale outbreaks of hepatitis E in the past in refugee situations and situations of population displacement. It's a very worrying indicator of the underlying risk, um, and it is particularly uh, impactful uh, on, on, in the health of uh, pregnant women. But uh, Rick can give more details of, of other signals or, or other information. So yeah. over to you, Dr. Pipacorn. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, so let me just give some figures. And I think it's, it's, it's not easy to get these figures because, of course, the surveillance system and the existing system is, is not working as it should work. But I think with the technical staff from the Ministry of Health, ANWA, and, and WHO since mid-October, so let me give you first some figures. We've seen 111,000 cases of acute respiratory infections, 12,000 cases of scabious lice, 11,000 diarrhea under 5, 36,000 uh, diarrhea over 5, 40,000 skin rash, 24,000. What Mike just mentioned, John Dish, 1,100 chicken pox, 2,500, and also meningitis, and, and, um, and 111 cases of which 74 in the last uh, two weeks. And abort trends. Now, what does it say? And it's difficult. So, diarrhea uh, increased if you compare it to last year, 45 times. I mean, uh, 30, 31 times uh, when you look at the under five, and and over 100 times when you look over the the, the above five years uh, when you compare it to 2022. So, yes, it's uh, deeply alarming. And and uh, colleague, we just had an, a team meeting with uh, our team in Gaza. And, and one of our colleagues had visited, an, uh, just as an example, an UNRWA school with uh, 19,000 uh, people with eight toilets with an enormous lack of water, etc. So, I mean, describes a little bit the situation. I mean, like the enormous need for for a wash, etc. We also... Um, the lab capacity, uh, normally those samples would go to Shifa and to the Turkish hospital where you had the central lab. Those are not functional anymore, as we know. So we are looking into, uh, can we bring in mobile labs? Can we uh, get samples out uh, to Egypt, etc.? We have to really uh, quickly start going on it. It's a very concerning situation. One other point I want to raise, routine vaccination. Routine vaccination in Gaza. Gaza and, and the West Bank have one of the best routine immunization actually globally, close to 100% for most vaccine based. Now, now, I mean, we, 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 we struggle, we together with, um, uh, with a UN team, UNICEF and WHO, we got some of the vaccines from the warehouse from the north over the last couple of days back to the south, et cetera. But we need to get going to, to make sure that, uh, children are getting vaccinated and and 
as Mike said, the system, and this is, I think, somebody, despite all the challenges, the Gaza and, and, and West Bank, East Jerusalem, OPT uh, health system produced health indicators at par, or I would say even better than his neighbors. Uh, so it is possible, and we should get back to that level. Over to you. Can I just supplement? Uh, because I think it's important, again, to recognize, too, that there was a, a, a very good system of surveillance before the conflict, and it was linked to a laboratory confirmation system that was based in a central public health laboratory that was housed in Al-Shifa and the Turkish Friendship Hospital in northern Gaza. So not only has uh, Gaza lost its hospital capability, it's lost its ability to confirm even the most basic of diseases in that context in terms of infectious diseases. This creates a blind spot uh, where we have huge risk of uh, epidemic diseases uh, in a context where we have limited capacity to diagnose those diseases uh, right now. Historically, many of those samples that might have been processed at the, C the Central Public Laboratory would also have gone to the West Bank or been sent to reference labs in Israel. That is no longer possible. So we're trying to work out how can we get samples uh, to move from Gaza back into Egypt and get reference facilities uh, in order to be able to do that. But right now, uh, not only is the potential for epidemics a, a risk for the people of Gaza, but not knowing what's happening, not being able to confirm having disease potential, potentially spread is, is, is a risk um, uh, that we don't want to currently leave in place. We're blind, in, 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 we're, we're blind at the moment to what is actually going on. And that's why we have very good syndromic surveillance on the ground. That means um, uh, health workers going around and, and, and filling in tally sheets for what they're seeing in the camps. But what we don't have right now is the capability to do on-the-ground diagnostics and be able to tell exactly what we're looking at. So, for example, in the case of acute jaundice syndrome or meningitis, it's very important to work out what the causative agents are because the routes of transmission are different, the agents are, are different. Meningitis can be a mild viral meningitis that doesn't need to be treated except with, uh, with antipyretics and IV fluids, but it could be bacterial meningitis that requires immediate treatment of a child to prevent death. So knowing what the diagnoses are becomes extremely important. So um, uh, this is something we do need to focus on in the coming weeks. But again, it's not that we have to provide this capacity to Gaza. This capacity existed before. It has been put beyond use of the system in Gaza, and we need to restore it. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Pibicorn. Uh, the next question goes to Mohammed Aslan of Andalou. Mohammed, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Margaret, uh, for taking my question. Uh, there is an information, and uh, it says no foil uh, reached the hospital uh, in the north of Gaza since the uh, humanitarian pause start. Uh, does WHO's uh, aid reach all part of Gaza? If not, uh, what is the uh, obstacle to this? Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that's one for Dr. Papercorn. Sorry. Um, thank you very much. I think uh, over the last couple of days, uh, WHO has, has, and I, I really want to stress, is really one UN together with 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 Anra and and Ocha, WHO led. We had a uh, mission, for example, today to the north to deliver fuel and medical supplies to Al Ahli and Al Sahaba hospitals, and and that was seven thousand liters of fuel to Al Ahli. Uh, covering their minimum requirements for the next seven days and 3,500 liters for Al Sahaba, uh, covering the minimum requirements for the next uh, seven days as well. We also had some medication and surgical supplies delivered to uh, those two hospitals. Uh, there's also plans to bring fuel to uh, Kamal uh, Adwan and, and Al Adwa Hospital. We uh, are planning that for tomorrow. We hope that that will continue. It is, of course, absolutely needed that uh, the those four remaining hospitals which are i would say barely partly functionals that they keep that they keep keep on going we would hope of course because we know there's there's still a number of uh, patients in al shifa and 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 they opened again for the dialysis uh, uh, as well as an indonesian not a 
there are still some patients and they will need fuel as well. And we hope and, uh, that we can also bring some fuel and some additional medication in the future there as well. But yes, over the last couple of days, so there have been, uh, there, 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 we have we have managed to bring a certain level of fuel and medical uh, medical medicine, essential medicine and equipment. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pipkorn. Uh, the next question goes to Omar Abdel Baki of the Wall Street Journal. Omar, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi there. Thanks for thanks for taking the time. Um, what countries have taken injured and sick Gazans for treatment? Um, how many Gazans have left for the strip for treatment? And is the World Health Organization helping facilitate this effort? Thank you. I'll start with Dr. Pipicorn, but maybe Dr. Noor can help as well. But we'll start with Dr. Pipicorn. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I think it's um, uh, WHO, as you know, have been assisting over the last week, actually, and I think the DG was referring to this as well, over the last 10 days now almost, to, to what we call to transfer, to transfer um, the most uh, vulnerable, uh, complex uh, uh, patients, uh, trauma patients, but also very sick, critically injured and sick from the north, some of the hospitals in the north to the south in, in, in Gaza and specifically to this larger hospitals in the south, the European Gaza Hospital, Nasser Medical Complex, uh, etc. That's one. There has been a number of patients transferred. I mean, you've seen all the, we've reported on the stories, of course, of the neonates and, and when I count Roughly, I think there's at least 40, 50 uh, more patients transferred. Uh, but what what we and this is not we do this, of course, uh, is led by the the technical uh, that's the Ministry of Health and the respective hospitals to to triage their patients to make sure like which patients need to be referred outside Gaza and which are the most critical patients over the next weeks and months. And what we really want to help facilitate is a more orderly transfer transfer of these patients into Egypt. First of all, it's absolutely needed and patients deserve that, that they get the treatment which which they need. Uh, but it's also, it will also, of course, relieve the, the completely overwhelmed uh, health uh, system in in Gaza. And, and I want to make one point on that. For example, one of the hospitals, we work closely with the European Gaza Hospital, uh, which is is having a 370 beds capacity, which included already a field hospital, which was established during the COVID period. They have more than 900 patients currently. So more than triple. Now, what is needed is this orderly, orderly transfer. And then, yes, there's a number of countries, and then, and maybe Mike want to refer to that as well. A number of countries have actually offered their services uh, to. They are they 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 are, they welcome the idea to actually get some of those referral patients for treatment in their country. But the first, the first and foremost, they need to be orderly trans, uh, transferred into Egypt. Get the treatment there, and and what happens uh, from there? Well, wherever they can get the best treatments, uh, there should uh, they should should be able to go there, including, of course, their families and companions. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pivko, and uh, Dr. Ryan will add something. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, we 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 thank all of uh, our member states for their in their intention to support people affected by this crisis. There's no question that all help is welcome. And, uh, um, and primarily, as, as Rick said, we need to help the people of Gaza in Gaza where they are, and we need to shore up that medical system. Uh, there has been a process of medical evacuation to Egypt, and I'd just like to recognize the government of Egypt and the, the Ministry of Health in particular. They have put 11,000 beds at the disposal of medical evacuation, 1,700 ICU beds, 
150 ambulances, 38,000 uh, physicians, 25,000 nurses. They really have stepped up, not just in LRE and around in terms of triage and stabilization, but in terms of onward referral within the Egyptian system. So there's an incredibly powerful capability within Egypt to do that. We have encouraged third parties, other countries, to work with Egypt to ensure that we, we have the transfer of patients to Egypt, their proper triage and assessment and clinical assessment, and then as needed, a discussion with third party countries to transfer maybe more complicated patients, patients that need uh, more intensive interventions for burns, uh, re repatriating nationals. There are various other reasons why. Uh, and in that sense, we think this is a, a useful enterprise. But again, the costs of doing this versus the actual costs of investing in the system and investing, as Rick said, in the ability to support people where they are, we have to balance those two things. We'd also like to recognize the government of France for deploying a medical ship uh, with special surgical capacities, uh, and they're working very closely with our Egyptian colleagues to base that uh, at El Arish, and they will be working in close collaboration with the Egyptian authorities on exactly the basis I explained earlier. In situations like this, and I think this is something uh, that we really all need to redouble down on. In a crisis, everybody wants to help, and that's fantastic. The real trick is to be coordinated and organized and deploy in a, in a meaningful and targeted way. So we look at EMTs. We're now beginning to see more coordination, more direction, uh, more strategic placement of these, and I think that's really beginning to help. The problem is when everyone rushes in to help, then we lose, the, we lose the directionality of the response. It's the same when you bring people out. It's got to be done in an orderly fashion, like we facilitated in Ukraine and we facilitated in, in, in other situations. And I think we would point our third countries really to work with Egypt to ensure that the patients that are being selected for onward referral can truly benefit from the process of international referral. Uh, and in particular, too, that the they be accompanied by companions uh, in a way that the person doesn't lose entire contact with their, their social networks. So it's very important that we don't just uh, take patients um, out of the system. They need to come with companions and the necessary social and psychological support. And their medical condition is only one part of what those people are suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Uh, Dr. Nuru is going to add something as well. Uh, just to add one thing that uh, the system is not new of Medivac before this crisis. Uh, Medivac existed um, between Gaza and um, West Bank and Israel, actually, which is not now is not possible, but also existed before with Egypt for cases like cancer and other um, chronic diseases, uh, only that uh, the needs have increased uh, many folds, just to add that uh, as a background. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Noor. Uh, we're running out of time, but we've got time for one more question, and that goes to Imogen Fuchs of the BBC. Uh, so Imogen, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, thanks very much. It, it's also about Gaza. Um, I'm really interested, in the, it's almost this note of um, optimism or planning for the future in um, what you're saying. Um, it, you talk about a crippled but resilient health service. What you're talking about seems to be based on the premise that fighting won't start again. I'm just wondering if you fear that's over-optimistic? I think I'll start with Dr. Ryan on this one. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Imogen. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if we've uh, communicated too much optimism, but I don't think myself or, 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 or Rick or Ilham or, or Ted Ross before were, were speaking in optimistic terms. You're absolutely right. What happens in any resumption of the violence is going to greatly affect uh, what's happening now. If, if, and we all hope, if there can be an extension of a pause, if we can get to a place, even with that happening tomorrow, even if peace was declared, we have a massive challenge ahead of us an absolutely gargantuan public health and health delivery challenge ahead of us. If fighting resumes, and particularly if that fighting pushes into Darabala, pushes into Khan Yunus, pushes into Rafa, we are going to see further displacement of people to the west, concentrating people on the western side of Khan Yunus, where there are very little in the way of services. 
Many people have been directed again and again to the area of Al Muwazi, which has no infrastructure whatsoever in place. Uh, to continue to concentrate people and push them through there with the promise that when they get there, there will be services for them, because again, that has been repeated again and again. Go there, because that's where you'll get the necessary assistance. Uh, I, I, I think there's, some, there's a very troubling narrative associated with that push of people. If, if, the, if the violence uh, starts again, then Imogen, that is a real scenario. And I really don't know what to say to you about that scenario. Because it is truly horrific in terms of the impact of so many people out in the open. We're not talking about uh, people in tented cities yet. We're talking about open ground onto which we could have up to two million people approaching into the depths of winter with their underlying nutrition status, with the overcrowding, with the stress, uh, and with uh, the wounded and the old and the disabled uh, and the mentally, uh, the mentally uh, and psychologically damaged uh, and, 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 and suffering, I, I really don't know. Um, I, 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 maybe Rick will speak to this. But if we go to that scenario and we see that happen, then I, I, I shudder to think, quite frankly, I shudder to think what will happen in terms of the numbers we've, we've seen up to now of deaths and casualties may be a distant memory uh, in, weeks, in weeks to come. It really depends what happens on the side of the, uh, on the, side of the, uh, the forces that are combating each other, and in particularly the occupying force, as to what its intentions are. And so the military and security intentions right now will determine life uh, and health in Gaza over the coming weeks. Maybe Rick wants to supplement, and Tedros may want to come in on that too. Over to you, Dr. Pippercorn. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because I want to be very clear, and, and if I have not been clear enough, then let me state it again. So, we are extremely concerned about the vulnerability of the, of the, what I call a cripple's health system. And we are extremely concerned uh, about this there's 12 hospitals in the south, of which some of them are more important than the other ones, which are currently the backbone of the health services of more than 2 million people. Now, we, what I think I have had made, made, made it clear. So when we would see a resumption of violence, and which potentially would also damage health facilities or make them even dysfunctional, uh, we have a further humanitarian disaster, an increasing humanitarian disaster. And I, again, I said the health system can absolutely not afford to lose more hospital beds. We need to expand. But also the resumption of violence would mean a resumption of violence in, in an even more densely populated area. Gaza is already the, the one of them, it is the most pop, uh, densely populated area in the world, or, or, or almost. Now we see 1.7 million people displaced. It's extremely densely populated. We have seen many, 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 many deaths and injuries. So we would expect much more, many more from, from, from a resumption of violence. Besides that, you will get more IDPs and IDPs, uh, IDP flows, etc. Everything related to that overcrowded shelters with what we just described, and, and, and uh, where we are very concerned in, in the increase of communicable diseases and, and and the chance of outbreaks. So you have that combination. So yeah, I mean, I think we are all extremely concerned, and it should not happen. The health system should remain as intact as possible. We should be able to expand the capacity, and it simply should not happen. Uh, so, yeah, if we didn't express that enough, extremely concerned. Over to you. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'll uh, end the Q&A session and hand it back to Dr. Tedros for any final remarks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll... Uh touch the um, last question. Um, are you optimistic? Um, maybe I wouldn't use the optimism and pessimism category, uh, but if you read uh, the reality on the situation, 
the chances of resumption of the conflict is very, very high. Um, and if that, that means uh, the health system is already broken, I mean, it just less than a third of the health facilities are, uh, you know, providing service. Uh, and even of providing, very difficult to, to, to say, it, providing service, actually, they're overcrowded and beyond their, their capacity. And the way they um, take care of their patients or the service is really, really bad. Uh, so you cannot say there is uh, service anyway. But for what it is, uh, at least there is a, a small proportion compared to what the Gaza had, uh, you know, providing service. Uh, but as you rightly said, okay, based on the situation, uh, resumption of the conflict is, uh, uh, you know, there is a high chance. Um, uh, but at the same time, I really believe that um, the humanitarian pause or even a ceasefire is possible if those with influence can take it seriously. I believe it's possible. Uh, so the question is, will those who have the influence will do everything to stop it? I mean, to stop, to, to sustain uh, the pause or then ultimately have a ceasefire and, um, uh, you know, having a political solution to, to, this, to this problem. So it's possible, except the, for the, you know, those with influence are not doing it. I mean, that's the, the, the situation. So it can, it, it, it can happen. It's a matter of uh, will, to be honest. So with that, uh, thank you so much for joining to the press uh, who joined us today. And uh, see you next time. show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.